Hi, everybody. I'll get my protein head on. We've been doing fiber next door. Merton's just did this huge model of, you know, five parts going ten different directions. I'm still trying to get it out of my head. Okay. So there's a lot of people working in this area. So I'm just going to integrate a few things. Some of you might have heard some of this, but I, I'm going to try to do things in a slightly different way. So, you know, just a little bit about what's first limiting. I think the question, you know, my, my question always when somebody wants to, you know, if we're talking about amino acids, we're just talking about ration formulation in general, is do we know what's first limiting? You know, I, I teach my class, and this is one of the first things I try to get them to understand is, you know, it might not be a nutrient, right? It might be everything going on around the cows. So there's all sorts of things that play into this. But then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of go through the things that <clears throat> I think we've, uh, at least in application, we've kind of missed and we're getting better at, but we probably don't do it as often as we should and we haven't made it routine. And, you know, when I'm working on, this, on the updates to the model, one of the things I'm trying to do is integrate all this stuff, not just me, the whole team. Uh, so intestinal stability, room and end requirements versus cow amino acid requirements. A little bit just kind of missing information in feed chemistry and then kind of integrating ME and MP when it comes to amino acids. You know, in this slide, we've used this a lot, but I think this is part of what we're trying to get at. You know, what are the total amino acid requirements and on what basis do we actually make that calculation? Right, because I think our problem has been for years that we've tied amino acid requirements just simply to amino acids and not to anything else in the diet. And as we learn more about metabolism and we understand that those things have to be integrated with energy, you know, then we're trying to figure out what gets to the small intestine. And, you know, this is where we integrate everything from feed chemistry to rates and pool sizes of feeds and then microbial yield and endogenous protein and all that kind of stuff we're not going to do now. But, you know, these are, this is really what we're trying to get at. Right? And then we need to know the amino acid profile of each component, and this could be its own talk because in the last couple of years, well, the, the swine folks, the poultry folks, figured this out a while ago. Um, but in the literature, you know, how many hours do we hydrolyze feeds for, for amino acids? It's 21. What if I told you that five of the amino acids don't come out until about 168? So what does that mean if all of our amino acid analyses have been based on 21-hour hydrolysis? We've had a lot of missing information, but it's not just the supply side, it's also on the requirement side because milk and tissue and everything else behaves the same way. I'm not going to do any of that today. We don't want to go there because that just kind of muddies the waters. <clears throat> Helene Lapierre has published a paper here in the last year with some of the correction factors on that. We've been working on it. Uh, my grad student, my PhD student, Andres Ortega, who spent like the last three years of his life trying to do the same thing with the sulfurs. The problem with the sulfurs is if you get 100 and some odd hours in and you didn't get rid of all your performing acid, they explode. And luckily, he was never standing there when everything exploded, but it wouldn't have been very pretty. They're, they're great teaching slides. Um, anyhow, so amino acid profile. And finally, the digestibility in the small intestine. And this is the one, and I'll spend a little bit more time on this. If we want to get to amino acids, we need to understand digestibility. And when I see people saying, I tried amino acids and I didn't get a response, well, that's probably because something else is first limiting, and a lot of times we don't know. And I'll give you an example of a study that we just did where we, we got caught with our pants down, right, Andrew? Um, <laughs> <laughs> where's Martina? Yeah, it's Martina's study. Yeah, there she is. Okay, so the question is, of these things, what's most limiting? It could be energy, right? So, you know, the swine folks and the poultry folks talk about digestible amino acids per unit of digestible energy. And we're still talking about crude protein. They're a long ways ahead of us, right? So I'm going to spend some time, some of this, I'll show you a study that we've already, that's been out a while. Um, but we need to catch up to the pig people, right? I, my joke about what are we doing with the CNCPS is I want to get to the point where we feed a cow like a pig, right? Because the pig diet's fairly simplified. Not that we're going to get rid of the forage, right? That's never going to happen, but we can get to the same metrics that we use in pigs, right? Because I think that would simplify what we're trying to do. And crude protein's really a bad metric. All right, so through all of this, there's been assays out there for years 
uh, three-step, modified three-step, uh, Tilly, Terry, you name it, everybody's done it. Um, and we ran a bunch of those and we found some things. So we, we found some things we didn't like, right? So we went back one more time, spent five years playing around with an assay. And again, no bags, different enzyme mix, no pancreatin because it didn't have any trypsin activity, some bile salts to get some emulsification, filter on a glass filter. Um, we have thought about going back to TCA precipitation for some of the soluble proteins and we've always got positive and negative controls. This data has been out for a few years. This was, I don't, I have a lot of data I can't show. Because right? people send us stuff and say, would you analyze this? But they don't allow us to show it publicly, right? I've got thousands of samples. But luckily these guys let us do it, right? So here's some blood, sam blood meal samples. The green is our positive control. The red is our negative control. It's basically the same blood meal. At this point, it's the same blood meal. This was thrown into uh, the oven overnight at very high temperatures. But this is the protein content, or nitrogen content, of those, uh, those blood meal samples. An average like 15 and a half, because you can see some variability here. Um, you know, and you can do the standard deviation on that. I should get rid of this stuff. Too many button pushes, right? So 14, 4 to 16, 6. All right, there's 22 samples. But there's the intestinal data stability of those samples. You say, Jesus, is that real? Well, you know, by golly, that's real. And it's really scary, isn't it? And it's frustrating as hell. And you don't think it happens, but I'm going to show you in a minute that it happens all the time. Even when you're trying to do a study where you thought you controlled for it. <clears throat> yeah, but you look at this and you say, okay, you know, here's our positive control, here's our negative control. That shouldn't, that's about, it should be somewhere between 5 and 7 and 8% digestibility at best. You know, and this one's running in the 83, 84, 85 range. So the mean is 61, but look at these samples. Look at the variability. And you say, geez, oh, Pete, what are we going to do? And one of our recommendations has always been to use the same supplier, because at least if you use the same supplier, you should have a consistent supply. Right? Well, that's the same plant over two weeks. So what does that tell us about consistent suppliers? It's really troubling, right, when you look at this. This is just blood meal. This is the most variable thing out there that we know of, but we all use a lot of it, you know, and if you're trying to balance for amino acids, in one week you got this load, and the next week you got that load, what's going to happen? Well, something's going to happen, right? And somebody's going to call you and say, geez, I just lost milk, you got to come back and fix it. And you, what do you know? Well, you're saying it's the same diet I fed last week. Why the hell would I be going back to fix it now? Right? When in fact it's just missing information. Right? So if you look at, uh, so I just got a couple slides here with some feeds. Here's the high quality blood meal. There's the heat damaged blood meal. And this is one of the other problems that we've had. We've used ADIN as our metric for indigestible nitrogen. Right? So here's, you know, in my argument, has been, well, that might work for forages. I'm not sure if it works for a non-forage feed. Right? Here's ADIN 4.7, 1.8. Here's the soybean. This is one, uh, just a solvent extracted soybean. There's the percent nitrogen. Here's a heat-treated uh, soybean meal product, 7.3. You look at that, you know, 1.7 versus 6.9. So that makes some sense. We heat-treated it, so what happened to the ADIN? It went up. Right, which is what we would expect. If the ADIN doesn't go up, then you, your heat treatment probably didn't do anything. But then when you look at uh, what comes out of our assay, 16% indigestible versus 93% indigestible, right? you're not going to see that with an ADIN. Okay? So we mean meal 8 and 11. Right? So you see some effect of the heat treatment on that, but actually this is pretty good because you don't want, when we analyze these things, and we've analyzed, Debbie's analyzed hundreds and hundreds of them, you don't want this going up too high because if it goes up too high, you, you overheated it, right? You bound up the protein. So you don't want to overcook it. Distillers, and I can't find enough, uh, we were, Andrew was helping me look for data. Debbie has a very funny filing system and we couldn't find everything we wanted in a hurry, but here's a couple of distillers. Uh, five, five, five and a half percent nitrogen, 1.8 to 4.7 ADIN. 
um, we're getting 20 to 24 percent unavailable nitrogen coming out of those two things. That's pretty typical distillers. We've seen that as high as 45 percent unavailable nitrogen. We've seen it as low as about 12. Okay, so that's so there is some variability. If there's another feed about as variable as blood meal, it's probably distillers. Okay, I'll mention with the data put together. You know, another soybean meal. ADI at points, ADI at point seven two nine point five. Here's a commercially protected product. Can't use the name. ADI at one point three eight. Uh, indigestible through the assay at fourteen and a half. Canola meal. Uh, ADI at five point nine eight. Twenty one percent indigestible. Um, and that's that's kind of that's a little bit higher than some of the canola meal, but not that far off. Canola is one of those. It's a really hard seed coat has a pretty good escape out of the rumen, which is why it provides a, uh, a lot of protein to the small intestine, has decent digestibility. Not as high as a soybean meal, but it's harder in the rumen, so you get more escape for the amount of protein you're putting in there. All right? So when you do all this stuff, does the cow care? Right? That's really what this comes down to. Can we get the cow to tell us anything? And we ran, the first study we ran was a blood meal that was probably the best blood meal on the planet, 9%, so 91% intestinal digestibility. Right, really good stuff. And then this was the blood meal that uh, Central New York Feeds had on the floor at the time we ran the study. It was 34% UN. It's just what they were, it's, it's what they had. So that's what we bought. A um, little bit difference in the nitrogen content. So we had to feed a little bit more of it. Um, just to remain iso cool, or iso nitrogenous. You notice that there's some canola in here. We had some cows that were later in lactation. So we wanted to remove this canola out of both treatments at some point because we didn't want to overfeed protein. Right. So those are the only differences. You can see here, 15.2% uh, protein, about 32% NDF, 30% starch. Um, ME's relatively balanced. Lysine and the thionine, they were different, right? This is part of your treatment effect because if you have something that's lower digestibility, then you're going to bind up some of the proteins and your amino acid ratios are going to change. But again, this is, for most of us, this is what kind of information? It's missing or unknown, right? Because we don't do these kinds of calculations, right? But here's, here's where the subtleties of all of us become really important, all right? And uh, so, you know, if you're gonna do these kinds of studies, you wanna make sure your nitrogen intakes are similar, and they were, and you can see what happens when nobody does the dry matters correctly for a week. Um, <laughs> But at least they went the same direction. Cows immediately said what? And we see that. Right? We see that. So they immediately responded by with a lower digestibility blood meal. They dropped in milk. Energy corrected milk. Okay? And then here, week five is when we took out the canola to make sure that we <coughs> didn't overfeed protein. So when you put it all back together, and almost all my slides are in kilos today, so 27 and 27, so intakes were good, nitrogen intakes were pretty much the same. Milk, we had about two kilos of milk, we had about two kilos of energy corrected milk, a little bit of a fat difference, a little bit of a protein difference. All right, and you can see all that here, okay, a little bit of an MUN difference too. So about four, four and a half pounds of milk, okay. If you and again, body, if you look at the body weight change and the body condition score change, those were not different. But the reason I'm putting that up there is that they still changed, which means they used what? They used nitrogen, right? They used energy, they used nutrients. So if you're going to actually do some calculations on where did all these nutrients go and how close are we to being balanced, you need to incorporate this information into um, your model evaluations, right? Nitrogen efficiency didn't really change much. Again, that's really energy driven, so if we didn't change energy to drive more milk protein or more milk output, then this really isn't going to very much. I, I always love, this, is, this to me is the best teaching tool that exists. So here's the actual milk, 42 and 40. Here's the predicted ME allowable milk for these diets, 46 and 46 are just you know, right around 100 pounds. Right, so the cows made 42 and 40 in the energy predicted is six kilos, 12 pounds higher. Is that good or a bad prediction? It's always a fun question to ask a bunch of people. Because almost everybody tells me it's what kind of a prediction. Well, it's a bad prediction, right? Because the cows didn't make 46. 
is usually what people pair it back to. But in reality, this is a great prediction from my perspective because the cows are what? They're first limited on what? Protein. On protein, right? So we do the evaluation on ADN and NDIN. Here's the predicted MP allowable milk, 45 and 45, so pretty close to the ME. And there's the predicted MP supply. If you'd use uh, Debbie's assay, predicted MP allowable milk is 42.6 and 39.3, and the cows make 42 and 40, right? So we're a kilo there, and we're 0.6 kilos there. So all of a sudden, the model does what? It, it bangs it right out, right? But again, missing information. It says that for some of these ingredients, we're going to have to move away from ADIN and NDIN as our proxies for escape and digestibility and all those things because we're, we're missing that information, right? We've got to be more like the pig people and get to some prediction of intestinal digestibility because there's milk in there and we don't, we, we just miss that information, right? So, you know, just for that study, final difference in predicted end supply is 32 grams or 4.8% of the intake, right? We're right down in the weeds, right? So, anyhow, understanding what's first limiting, to me, this is really important. This is what the, the power of modeling is, and this is probably how we should think about formulation. Here's study number two. Um, we had a hiccup between feed watch and the feed wagon on this study, so I'm just gonna do a quick summary. Um, high digestibility blood meal, Low digestibility um, blend of feather meal and blood meal. ME and MP allowable milk at 46 and 43 kilos, so they were designed to be um, protein limited a little bit. Bottom line is, is that e even though we had some feed delivery issues here, energy corrected milk was about 3.3 kilos different, right? So we're talking about 78 kilos of milk or pounds of milk different based on the digestibility. But we wanted to redo this study. Of course, where Martina comes in. So 96 cows, 316 cow pens, about 80 days of milk at the start, milk 3X. Treatments were about 1.2 kilos of a 70% feather, 30% blood meal blend, or one kilo of blood. Everything else was, was similar for isochloric and isonitrogenous diets. What was different about this is that we didn't we didn't drop the protein way down like we did on the first study. This is kind of like what happens if you're not trying to crank down the protein and you just want to find out does digestibility mean anything, right? Because this is one of the things that I hear back is, Mike, I don't think this matters. I don't see it. I don't see what you're telling me. And most of the time when people tell me that, what they're really telling me is I'm already feeding so much protein that if there's a shift in digestibility, it won't matter, right? So, this study's kind of run in, a, in one of those where you're not really trying to crank it down for whatever reason. NDF around 32, starch around 27 to 28. There you guys can see the basic premise of this. Here, this is where this gets interesting, right? Because we do all this work and we think we're gonna conduct a study and then we find out that we got caught. So here's the blood meal, here's the pre-study, right? We run this stuff through, we, we say, okay, we wanna maintain that particular ingredient uh, so we can make sure that that's what we formulate. The blood meal was 16% indigestible, the feather meal was about 47% indigestible. So this is what we formulated on. And then the stuff shows up, right? And this is all post hoc, right? So this stuff shows up, we start feeding it, what do you think the cows are telling us? And this ain't right. And I don't know what you guys formulated, but we're not gonna follow your guidelines, right? So you run through the study going, I don't understand, you know, and I'm not very happy um, because it isn't, the, they're not following the script, right? Well, then we analyzed the blood meal. We went from 16 prior to the study, the first batch that went into the mix was 47% indigestible. Well, that'll screw your study up. <laughs> and look it, the feather meal was what? It was more digestible than the blood meal. Well, that really screws your study up. Because all of a sudden, and what was it, week three, week five, and week six, Martina? Yeah, three, four. They were inverse, right? All of a sudden, the feather mill group's making a hell of a lot more milk than the blood mill group. But I'm thinking the feeders eating the cows backwards, getting the wrong pens. You want to scream at everybody because it's not working. You guys ever have that experience? <laughs> you, know, you must be screwing up the diet. No. 
Somebody senses something that isn't what we thought it was. Now what do you do? Why don't you just run your study? Look what the second batch did. 15-8, right back to where we were. These guys, right back on script. Right? And you look at the ADINs, and you wouldn't, you, you know, the feather meal always looks bad on an ADIN, but it doesn't look like this. <coughs> so then you look at the milk. So on the first batch, you know, we got a little bit of a milk difference here, 44 versus 43, but it's, it's significant because we got enough cows and pens and repeatability, but overall, you know, these cows are performing pretty darn well, right? We're, we're cranking out over 100 pounds of milk, of energy corrected milk, <laughs> fat's really high, protein looks pretty good. Protein here, you know, 2.983, the feather meal protein content was higher, the cow's <laughs> the protein content was higher in the feather meal than it was on the blood. <clears throat> oh boy. Okay, second batch. Now, oh, we got, now, now we're starting to reverse ourselves here, now we're 14.6 and 41.4, right? So now all of a sudden we're starting to open up, this is following our script <coughs> a little bit more, right? But again, we're feeding a high, you notice our, our MUNs here are high by our standards. Normally we're in that eight to 10 range. So these are, we're, we're still kind of overfeeding protein and the cows are telling us what? They still know they're different, right? And we can predict that. And that's my point is I think there's a bunch of missing information here that most of us aren't generating or we aren't using yet. Um, but this is playing with us in ways that we don't always understand and it really screws up our attempts to balance for amino acids, right, if we want to come back to that. Uh, but it just causes frustration, you know. I, I, everybody else had to be wrong. In fact, it was just simply the feed, and it was unknown information, okay? So enough on that. So improving efficiency of nitrogen use. I think the thing that, um, you know, I'm, and we've known this for a long time, milk protein output and overall protein efficiency is really a function of energy supply. Right? It's not a function of protein supply. Amino acid balance enhances the efficiency of energy utilization. Urinary nitrogen or urinary urea nitrogen is variable. It's really a function of nitrogen intake and recycling. It's also the most volatile form. If she's peeing it away, what is she telling us? She doesn't need it, right? And I'm, I'm using this metric simply because we're predicting this with relatively high accuracy within the structure of the CNCPS, and it can be a really powerful tool independent of getting more energy into a cow, if you can't get more energy into a cow to drive milk, protein, and just overall protein output, you can get rid of all the stuff that she is wasting, right? And, you know, Norman's out, Norman's not in here, but he's outside. Here's one of, here's one of Norman's studies, one of Alex Rostroff's studies, and you can see here nitrogen intake, we're going from 429 to 754, here's fecal nitrogen relatively flat, and urinary nitrogen is going up almost 200 <coughs> grams, right? So it basically says, hey, if they don't need it, they're gonna pee it away. The question is, is where should we be here and how do we make them more efficient? And when you look at this data and you look across lots of studies, you can see things like this where nitrogen intake goes up and this is milk protein nitrogen converted to, or milk, yeah, this is milk protein converted to a nitrogen basis, not milk urea nitrogen. You know, there's no big change there. You see a little bit of an upward slope, but nothing's going on. Here's fecal nitrogen. You know, here's urinary nitrogen. And most dairies are running here right now. We're putting out more urine and fecal nitrogen than we're putting out milk protein, right? This is, we have to change this, right? And given, you know, we've had a little relaxation of some of these laws, but I'm hearing on the books now, ammonia emissions coming up. And Larry's nodding his head, I know that's pretty high on the list here in New York. It's very high on the list in California and Wisconsin and places like that. So if ammonia emissions become a big deal. Getting rid of this urinary excretion is gonna become a big deal for all of us because this is one of the only ways I know to outrun that immediate um, uh, problem, right? And then what we'd like to do is say, hey, if you can get your urine and your feces, or your urine and your milk on a one-to-one -one basis, and all of a sudden, what did you do? You went from 650 grams of nitrogen intake a day to about 620, right? Or maybe even as low as 600. So you got rid of 50 grams times 6.25, you got rid of 400 grams of protein, right? Almost a pound of protein, right? That's a lot, right? If we could figure out how to do that, and then if we're really on our game, we should be putting out, we should be one to one point something to one on milk to urine. You know, and as we do this, what we're really telling the cow to do 
is to be more efficient by recycling more nitrogen back into the system. The other thing you learn from looking at this data is that one, once you fix the energy, this is all energy is first limiting, yeah, you only need to feed about 14% protein in, according to these diets to, to meet that amount of milk output, right? And then it starts to drop off over here. So again, this is, we have this in the structure of CNCPS. You, you get it in many forms, depends on which version of the model you're looking at. But you get this productive end to total end at 34, and you get productive end to urine end, and this is a good one, 1 1.26 to 1. Okay, and then from that, Larry worked on this several years ago and said, Mike, I think this equation would be good. Uh, and you can get the ammonia potential from that. Right, so you could actually predict the ammonia potential per cow uh, through this kind of calculation. Right, so we're trying to give you guys the tools. So if somebody comes to you and says, hey, we gotta, we got to knock this ammonia excretion down, uh, here's your primary tool, at least doing it from a nutrition perspective. Right, because as you, as you force less into the urine, what you're doing is the kidney's making the decision to send more of it back here. So it's going to go through the cycle to be used by the microbes to be captured. And that's how we improve the efficiency, and we can see that here, and this gets a little complicated, here's dietary protein, here's urea entry rate. In other words, this is um, the fraction of urea entry rate that's going into the bloodstream. So this is the ammonia being converted to urea entering into the pool. And you can see that as we go to these, at these low ends where we don't operate, these are beef cattle, um, you know, down here, they're not recycling anything. You get up here at the top and they're pushing, you know, 70 to 80 percent of that back to ammonia and then into the urea pool. We're operating someplace in here. So look where our number's at. You know, we're in that 50 to 60, 65 percent range on the amount of protein going in to the urea pool. And we want to move down here a little bit so we can increase that efficiency. And the inverse of that is, is what goes back into the system, right? So if it's not, if it's as we increase the amount of recycling, this is how much goes back because it's all a proportionality function. But you can see that it's fairly uniform. You go to those low proteins, it's scavenging everything. Some of it, most of it doesn't even leave. And here now some of it's leaving, but it's coming back, right? Because the rumen needs it to maintain nitrogen homeostasis for microbes, okay? So we can do that. When we operate in the range that we work in, this is from some work that Aaron Rechtenwald did. Here's urea entry rate, and here's gastrointestinal entry rate, and you can see what? It's a fairly linear response, right? They will recycle kind of whatever they eat, but we can use this to get to a higher efficiency, and this is where the dropping the urine will force more of this back into the gastrointestinal tract, right? The kidneys making that decision. But again, we can do this very simply just looking at what they're peeing away, okay? So the cow's really adapted at doing this. You know, she wants to maintain nitrogen retention. She wants to support the microbial population. She's gonna, you know, about 50 to 70%, if you look at all the data of intake nitrogens converted to urea. Does that sound like a high number? For somebody that balances for amino acids, this should scare the pants off of you because it says, you know, that's a lot of amino acids being converted to what? Ammonia. Right, but she interconverts it, right? And 30 to 45% of that intake is recycled back to the gastrointestinal tract. We can modify this, and that's how we improve efficiency. The urine output is one way to do that in a very applied way. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears again. So these are all things to think about when we're trying to figure out how do we improve efficiency and get more precise diets, right? 32 cow, 3,200 cow dairy. This was in uh, the western U.S. somewhere. Um, this, and I'm showing you this because it, I want to change directions now and think about how a cow uses nutrients. Four high cow pens, two control, two RP lysine. This is back in the CPM days, right? So we're going way back now. Uh, balance for 113 pounds of milk, 3.6, 3.0 true protein. You know, to get zero MP balance, we knew at the time we had to balance at about 225 negative um, to do that correctly and then zero on ME. Methionine was targeted at 2.4 and lysine at 6.7, and then they added a room-protected lysine. It was a fat-protected product, so they ex just exchanged some of the dietary fat for the uh, protected lysine to get the lysine up to 7.2%, right? So this screen is familiar to some of you with either no hair or gray hair. Um, 
anyhow, you, you could go through and do all these calculations based on what, what was going to happen, right? And what the ratios were to set this all up. So I'm just showing you what was going on. And then as you added the product back here, it was 6.67. And then here it was 7.25 for the lysine as a percent of MP. And here it's a three to one. And here it's a 2.77 to one. So those should all sound like familiar numbers. And here's what you get. This is a field study, right? So here's the start of the study, the end of the study. Uh, red line is the control. The blue line is the RP uh, lysine, right? Typical daily milk weights, right? Kind of a mess. So what do you see going on? Is there a little bit of milk there in those? You know, and the cows are doing pretty well, right? We're looking at cows in that 100, 110, 112 pound range. So you see a little bit of milk there. And we also see a little bit of what? Here's milk protein. Okay, during the treatment period. When you guys put amino acids in the diet, what are you expecting? How many of you expect a protein response? Come on, audience participation. How many of you expect a milk volume response? How many of you expect a milk fat response? How many of you have seen a milk fat response? Yeah, which one do you model? And this is always a troubling thing. So here's milk protein, here's milk fat. Right, again, noisy data, but it's daily milk weights. So is it a protein efficiency thing or is it a feed efficiency? So dry matter taking the cows on feed was 59.1, didn't change during the study. Milk volume increased three pounds, milk protein increased 0.15 pounds, milk fat increased 0.1 pounds, energy corrected milk change was 3.44 pounds a day. Overall feed efficiency improved 3.3%. So is it a protein efficiency, a fat efficiency, or a milk volume efficiency? And the answer is yes, it's all of the above. The point is, what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make to you guys is it's an integrated system. And we, I can tell you after looking at this for years and trying to model this stuff, you never know what she's gonna do with this carbon. We wanna put it in there because we want her to get a, an amino acid response. But she might say, no, I get this pathway that if I fill this pathway, I'm much more energetically efficient and that allows me to make more lactose. And I'm just gonna do that, okay? They don't follow our script and saying, gee, I put that amino acid, I'm gonna get more milk protein. We will find the amino acid carbon in fat. It's a really interesting thing, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is I think you guys should, we, I, I want people to get off this, put amino acid and get a milk protein response. What I want to think about is if we do this right, we get an energetic response. It's you're increasing the energetic efficiency of the cow by removing the, nutri the limiting nutrient, right? It's not a milk protein, it's not linear. So, and I tell people to formulate on energy corrected milk I got a funny story I don't have time to tell right now about a guy in, in Italy who did all this kind of stuff. He kept telling me, Mike, it's not working, right? Because what was he looking for? He was looking for milk protein percent. And he, it's all he wanted was milk protein percent. Well, the milk protein percent didn't shift. But when we back calculated everything, he got three kilos of energy corrected milk. He said, well, that's not important because I don't get paid on that. Wow. Okay, that's a different problem. All right, <laughs> I'm not going to fix that part of the Italian system, right? But, uh, so that captures milk volume, protein, or fat. In the most conditions, it's easier to detect than a particular composition change. You know, there's lots of things going on, but I think if we just started looking at energy-corrected milk, that kind of helps us uh, sort some of these problems out. And, and just to kind of reinforce this idea that it's, it's a lot of this is tied to energy, we can all go back 25, 30 years and look at all the euglycemic, insulinemic clamp work that was done either by Bauman's group, uh, Brian Beckett, there's a bunch of people. And we know that if we, if we put in insulin, what happened to milk protein, as long as we put some glucose in there too, what happened to milk protein output? It always went up. And then if we gave them a little bit more protein, what happened to milk protein output? It went up, right? Which says that milk protein output and milk synthesis is really an energy-driven event. So, if we're thinking about it that way, then our amino acid requirements should probably be tied to what? To energy, right? Not to some protein calculation. All right, so that gets us to what is the optimum supply. And we've done this, many of you have seen this. This data set's been around for a long time. Helene has used it extensively. We've used it extensively. You know, you get to these, you get to these efficiencies. And what we did is we re-derived the whole thing to be grams 
of amino acids per mcal of me just like a pig right so we get this 1.14 grams of methionine per mcal of me we get 3.03 grams of of lysine per mcal of me and then on an essential amino acid basis you know 5.7 and 15 1 all right, and we show that simply because if you go back to the data from Schwab and Ruhlquin, everybody says, well, are these, do these numbers make sense? Well, when you put it on an essential amino acid basis, it actually, you know, Schwab was 14, 9, and 5, 1. So 14, 9, and 5, 1. Well, kind of going in the same direction. 14, 7, and 5, 3 for Ruhlquin. All right, so even though these numbers are different, to some degree, they're going the same direction, right? So it gives us some comfort that this approach actually isn't that far off, right? This is a primer. Andrew's going to talk about this a lot, you know. But one of the things, and I was reluctant to show this, but I'm going to do it just because we've shown some of the other data real quick. You'll get the full story uh, on Thursday, right? What we tested, what Andrew was testing, were these numbers, right? Are these numbers right? So he came back, he ran a study, you know, this is how we get our numbers. But one of the things that you'll look at is you'll see these standard deviations, right? There's some noise around that. We picked the optimum that we thought was there, but the supply has a range to it. So what Andrew did is he ran those ranges. He went up one standard deviation, here's the ideals. He went down one standard deviation and went up one standard deviation, and what do you see? You go down one standard deviation and milk significantly goes down. You go up one standard deviation and the milk was not significantly different, right? And the true protein was not significantly different. So what does that tell us? One, it tells us that those numbers that we generated aren't that far off. Two, it says cows actually respond to this grams of amino acid per unit of energy thing, right? Which simplifies what we do because now we could balance for all what? All essential amino acids. We could abandon crude protein. Well, that would be novel, wouldn't it? All right? Then all of a sudden, you guys are going to be asking for, well, what do we do with this tryptophan number? All right, who the hell thinks about tryptophan in a cow? I don't know. But anyhow, we'll figure it out. To bring it back to something that's more applicable, I'll do it back to 655, because this is what I work with. When we redid this, we ended up at 2.6 is our, our uh, you know, digestible methionine is the percent of MP is the break point. In practical application, and again, Andrew's going to hit this, but we've been sending this out there for a while. Andrew's going to update the numbers, but somewhere around 1.14 to 1.16 grams of methionine per mcal of ME if you're using this, right? And then the lysine breaks at about 7, whereas we thought the ideal was somewhere around 7.2 to 7.4, right? And the, the, all models are different. We're all kind of converging, though, as we improve them. They all kind of get to the same number. So the way I tell people to think about this then, so we've gotten rid of the urinary extra, extra nitrogen that we were feeding. Now we've got room to put these amino acids in there, and we know that it's energy driven. So we've got cows eating 60 mcals, 1.15, so we should have 69 grams of metabolizable methionine. The lysine requirement, you know, you do your ratios, 2.7, so you multiply that out. You need 186 grams of lysine. All right, so this would be your starting point for evaluating where you're at relative to the energy intake of those cows. Always do methionine first because that's what we derive this relationship on. If you do it backwards, it doesn't always work, right? We've seen some things go sideways that way. So start with the methionine because we feel most comfortable with that relationship. So what do we do? Just to wrap up, you got to determine what's most limiting. Is it energy or protein? Do the cows in the model agree, right? If the cows in the model don't agree, what are you going to change? Again, evaluate rumen imbalance and urine nitrogen excretion. If it's high, then work to reduce the soluble protein or just the total amount of protein. If it's grams of MP in excess, then de decrease the MP from feed in, in small increments. Once you have ME and MP in balance and you're happy with rumen N, now you can focus on amino acids and you come back to this. You know, I'll do the 1.15 grams of MP for M per mcal of ME and then follow in your lysine ratio. So I, I think what this does for us is that it increases our opportunity to formulate for amino acids. Um, it also means that we got to understand variation, right? And I gave you a couple examples of that. Um, and I'm, I'm guilty of communicating in probably not such a good way when I saw some of those cows doing what they were doing. Um, but you want to make sure that everything agrees with each other, get rid of the non-functional protein, replace that with amino acids, 
and operate somewhere around 100% of your MP if you're okay with all that. And that'll take any questions. In your, uh, your feather meal versus blood meal uh, study that you showed, mm -hmm. there was actually a 4% uh, milk fat and a uh, meat one protein. Um, do you have anything to say about the gap between those two and you know how to interpret uh, that gap in different diets? It seems like um, here. Down here? Yeah. So in some diets you get um, with a 416 butter fat, it seems like the protein is a little bit on the low side on, on that diet. Anything, any comments on how you interpret one? Uh, uh, you know, I would expect to see a protein a little higher than that, no protein a little higher than that with uh, that high fat. Yeah, I ask those questions myself sometimes. I don't know if I have a good answer for you. Again, we were not looking at specific amino acid balancing. I, I would probably guess that, you know, because we didn't look at lysine and methionine, maybe we're a little bit low on that. I don't know. We haven't gone back to reevaluate the diets that I'm aware of. This is all fresh off the press kind of stuff. We will put this back through the model to figure out where we're at with all the amino acids. And I guess is my guess is that's where some of that's at. Yeah, and I've had the opposite happen too, where at a 3.7 butter fat and a 3.4 protein, you know, I'm like, wow, it's great, but why is the protein so high compared to the butter fat? Yeah, and I always wonder about subtle effects, and you know, we haven't gone back and integrated all this in here, right? So if I, if I look at what Barbano's telling me, and I think about forage digestibility and shifts in forage and pool size and, and all that kind of stuff, I think that some of the fuel source in the background could be shifting and we're just not aware of it because it's such a subtle change, right? If all of a sudden your PD, potentially digestible NDF, goes down a little bit, right? You didn't compensate with some more uh, carbohydrate, fermentable carbohydrates sometime, some kind. What happens to insulin signaling and all that kind of stuff downstream? I, you know, those are all subtleties. But that stuff is all missing information. What I do know is if we all if we, if we get that information put together and we go back and reassess it, we can pull some of that out with our current version, with the new, the developing version of the model. But, but isn't the most logical explanation of that those cows are probably losing weight? Uh, no, because they're 80 to 160 days in milk. And we, I have the body weights. They were not. I took the body weights out. They were not losing weight. These are not really lactation cows. No, that's that's a good point. If they were really lactation cows, and I I go with you, Larry, but they're not. Yes. Um, I some of this change um, if you're looking at first lactation animals that are still growing. Yeah. So we have first lactation cows in these pens. Yeah, we did. About 25% of the cows in the pens are going to be first lactation. So we can capture that information. Most of the time, if you're really deficient on digestibility or you're really low on digestibility, they're, they're, what's going to happen is you see a bigger hit on milk production because they're always going to prioritize growth over lactation. All right, so they, they look worse than the mature cows. But that's a real effect. Uh, just to clarify, what I was look, I was uh, my comment was on total bulk tank. You know, the, the entire dairy. You know, uh, when I when I said uh, sometimes we see a oh, a three yeah. four protein. You know, I'm not talking about a specific pen. You know. God, I hate bulk tank data. <laughs> cool. What do you do with? I'm, and I'm not picking on you. I get that all the time. It's like, how many cows? Two thousand cows. Oh my yeah. God. I know you get paid on it, but the problem is, is that we're, all right, I'll, 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 I'll take that. But the question is, is how do you diagnose a bulk tank? How do you diagnose a bulk tank? The bulk tank didn't make the milk, right? It's what string, what pen, what group is the anomaly? 
the, the one you really should be fixing. That's just, that's why when I get the bulk tank, and nobody, and I see you guys shaking, I'm, I'm with you. This, we have the same damn conversation next door about everybody wants to send in one feed sample and get the perfect answer and have it fast and no variation. And have it be cheap. 24 hours, <laughs> right? All you guys would vote for that, right? I can tell you, we got to all the Forge Labs next door and we're having fits, right? You know, because Ralph Ward and I look at each other and, and look at everybody and say, well, at least do duplicates. Ah, oh, it's too damn expensive and it costs too much. Well, at least you can take the mean of whatever the hell you did, right? But that's the same with the bulk tank, right? Is it the high cow pen? that is the farthest away from the parlor for some strange reason and has all this walking to do and is really the one giving you fits because they gotta walk three miles a day, right? I remember being on a farm a few years ago, 5,000 jerseys, where was the fresh cows? They were at the complete opposite end of the milk parlor. And guess what they were doing every day? We talk about extreme athletes, they, but they looked like it. They were skin and bone. Everybody's trying to figure out what the problem is. Put a pedometer on them, you'll figure it out real quick, right? It's just stupid things like that, but they, that nobody could figure out the problem, right? It's just distance travel and time not in pen, right? But you can't see that in a bulk tank. So I, I don't know what to do with bulk tank data, right? <clears throat> I would love to figure it out, but I, you got it, you got somehow, we got to get some, some pen data somewhere. Any other questions? Thank you. Here, put your fiber hat back on it. <laughs>